We titled this panel Tools, Resources to Enrich Your Reporting, uh, but we should also include people um, to help in enrich your reporting um, because we have uh, some very good folks here today who are experts in, in their field. Um, for news organizations, uh, as you know, presidential elections represent all hands operations. This election, however, promises not only to test staffing limits uh, while also ensuring that they are prepared to take on the assignments. That requires knowing the rules of the game, as we discussed yesterday in the review of election laws and the people who are essential to carrying out that work. We hope you find this session instructive on both of those counts. Uh, Pam Fessler, uh, may be the only reporter I know who actually carved out an elections beat of her own. Uh, Pam was an editor and correspondent at NPR uh, for nearly 30 years, covering voting issues, poverty, and philanthropy. She now serves as an advisor uh, with the nonpartisan elections group, um, helping election officials improve their communications with the public. Uh, next to her is Tina Barton served as the city clerk of Rochester Hills, uh, Michigan, and a member of the state's election security commission. She is now a senior elections expert with the elections group. Uh, before joining the group, Tina was a senior program advisor to the executive director at the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. Next to Tina is David Becker. Some of you are familiar with all of them, and, and, and also I've, I've noticed a few uh, rejoining their relationship with David here today. He is executive director and founder of the nonpartisan nonprofit Center for Election Innovation and Research. The center works with election officials of both parties around the country to build trust in the system. Uh, David also manages the center's election official legal defense network, uh, a very important part of, of this uh, election cycle, providing pro bono legal assistance to election officials who are threatened with frivolous criminal prosecution, harassment, or physical abuse, or physical violence. Um, apart from that, uh, what I found interesting in, in his bio is that he is a two-time Jeopardy champion fact, and a winner on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? So reach into his pockets. <laughs> That's okay. We'll still be reaching into your pockets. But <laughs> um, Pam, <you're... laughs> Pam either won or lost the flip today, so she's going to be starting us out. Please welcome the panel. people are still very confused about how the election process works. So I wrote this guide because I feel like it's very, very, your, your job is more important than ever, right? Uh, uh, pr trying to uh, tell the American public what in fact is going on when it comes to their elections. I mean, they really rely on you. Um, so I wrote one, and then the other reason I wrote this is because I know that a lot of new reporters are gonna be thrown into this beat this year, um, especially on the local level. And um, you might also have like 25 other things to cover or maybe have never covered elections before. So I decided to kind of write a guide that I wish somebody had given me when I started covering this many, many, many years ago. Um, I, I, we have it, I, I, you obviously have a paper copy, but it's also online, which the online version, you can go to all the links because there's lots of resources there, links to resources, story ideas, and background information. So this is mostly focused on new reporters who have not covered elections before, but I think, I know a lot of you have done it before and you've covered the voting beat, um, but it might have some helpful hints for you as well. Um, so, um, just some of the basic things. Okay. Um, there you go. All right, I'm gonna go back here because I can't actually see it. Um, so it's divided into a couple of things, a, a, a few sections. So the first thing, overview for just starting, if you're covering the voting beat, um, 
you, there are three basic things to know. And I apologize if this is stuff for some of you, you already know this stuff, but for, for other people don't know. One, just to keep in mind, overall elections are run differently in every single state. They're run differently in counties within states. And so it's very important when you go to, to, to try and figure out this incredibly complicated um, landscape. Um, what is illegal in some places is not only legal, but encouraged in other places when you take things like what people sometimes call derogatorily um, ballot harvesting, that something like um, people being able to deliver ballots for other people. In some places that's illegal, in other places it's fine, and again is encouraged. The other thing is I think it's very important to just come on this beat and understand elections are not perfect, right? They're run by people. There are always gonna be problems. There are always gonna be mistakes. And I think our job as journalists is to try and, and, and differentiate what are small mistakes, which are um, the result of human error and might not have an impact on voters from maybe big mistakes or problems that will have an impact on voters, or what are made up problems. Things like Sharpie Gate, things like the fact that, you know, uh, that are conspiracy theories. And it's very important that that is one of the most important things that you can do for the public, is to differentiate what are um, serious problems and what are not. The other thing that, so I covered this beat for 28 years, or 20 years, and, um, I've covered many other beats, but it's great because there are so many people who are willing to help you, so many resources, you know, people like Tina and David. There is a very um, close election community in this country, people who have devoted their lives to elections, and you have so many sources and people that you can turn to, not the least of which are the fact that there are thousands and thousands of election officials in this country, and many of them are not only experts in what they're doing in their own community, but also uh, have a good perspective nationally. Um, so the thing, we have 10 top tips for uh, reporting of covering the beat. Um, one of the first things I always tell people is go get to know your election official and to do it right now. So if you're gonna be covering the voting, voting issues, if you don't know your local election official, you should do it now because they're only gonna get busier. Exchange information with them, let them get to know you so that they trust you so that when something happens in um, October or November or maybe even December, you know who to call, they will answer your call, and then we'll give you the information that you need. The other thing I have found, so I've been working with a lot of election officials since I retired and started working with the elections group. They don't really understand. A lot of them have no clue how the media works. They're constantly asking me, what does the media want? You know, I'm like, well, they want to find out the information. Um, anyway, you, you should tell them how they can help you do your job because they do, they want, they want the uh, public to also be accurately informed. They, you, they need to know about deadlines, they need to know how you, um, you know, how you need information given to them. Uh, the other thing, go learn the process, get a tour, go to your local election official, go to the local election office, just see firsthand how it works. Go to, like, do a story about um, poll worker training classes. It's just really, it's really, um, it teaches you a lot about how the system is supposed to work. Go to when they test machines. Go, um, you know, watch them uh, as, they, as they're trying to print ballots um, or design ballots. It, it's really a fascinating process, and if you know that stuff now, or can learn it now, you can explain it better to the public and also be, you're able to identify when somebody comes up with some claim that there's something funny going on, you'll be in a much better position to, um, to verify whether in fact that's true. Um, Oh, know the rules. That's you know just I, I mentioned that before to learn what's what what is governing it, the elections in your area. Um, the other thing, we're not just talking about elections. So there's so many people who are involved in elections. You have advocacy groups. You have the political parties. You have um, attorney generals. You have the legal community. There's just a whole and it's all listed in here. Um, the other thing I would highly recommend. I, I think you, you, you should. 
the, is that the next step? No, nope, that's the wrong one. Um, I'm sorry. I'm not very technical. Um, don't, don't ignore the conspiracy theorists. I mean, I really think it's very important um, as a journalist to go and find out what it is that is motivating the people who are challenging elections, who are making claims about, um, um, you know, maybe things not going the, the way they want it to go. Um, I think it's important to find out who they are, what they're doing, where they get their information from, and, and why they believe what they do believe. Um, I've spent a lot of time um, in, during uh, reporting on election things, going to going with some of the election integrity people and going through voter rolls and what they're seeing and why they're um, you know, very concerned about problems with voter rolls. Um, anyway, I think it's really important to keep, to, 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 to report that and I don't think there's enough. Um, you know, you have to obviously put in context what people are claiming, but I think it's important to make those connections so you understand what is actually going on. Um, do, 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 do. Other really important thing, find out what keeps election officials up at night. What are the things they're preparing for? They're big planners. What are they worried about? Um, are, are they worried most about cyber attacks? What are the things that they are planning for and concerned about in this particular um, um, upcoming election? Um, my other big piece of advice, having covered this for a really, really long time, is to expect the unexpected. Every single election, something has come up that people were not anticipating, whether it was the pandemic, whether it was uh, voting machine problems or long lines. It's, we're always preparing for what happened in the last election. So of course, right now, people are worried about domestic, uh, domestic um, uh, violence or, or uh, challenges to the election. Well, it could be something, it could be some big type of in infrastructure attack uh, from Iran or China. I mean, there are many, many things. So just be open to the fact that honestly, anything can happen and that you just have to keep an open, uh, keep, keep your eye out. Honestly, it happens every election. <laughs> right, Tina? Yes, yes it does. <laughs> I testify. Um, other real quick, um, just beware words and labels, um, what, how they're used in the election. Um, I've talked about that a little bit more in the guide, things like election, people talk about election integrity, just how people use words. I notice on a lot of reporting, people um, will confuse ballots and ballot applications. Um, just be very careful how you use words because that only adds to the confusion uh, that the public has. Um, obviously, a very important thing, I don't know why we have seven and seven, but, um, you know, a very important role, I think, for, for the media is to give voters news they can use, and you just discussed that a little bit in the last session. I think it's just very important. People turn to the media to, just to find out when to vote, where to vote, um, you know, and, and, and who, to vote, who, who are the candidates. Um, and also, it's a way for you to continue to establish a relationship with your local election officials and to learn the process. I also think it's important to talk about, you know, sort of the good things that are happening with voting. I mean, there really are some heroic stories of people not only who run our elections, but are, are um, who volunteer. Um, I think Jocelyn mentioned that yesterday, the talking about, you know, it's, it's really kind of an incredible process and it's great to do stories, I think, that um, are um, on the positive side. And, and then just to talk a little bit about, you know, I also feel like it's important and, and a little bit, in, there's some resources in the guide. Um, just why do we care about this story so much? You know, why is it so important? Why is, or are people so passionate about that? And to get a little bit of sense of what we're talking about and why voting matters so much in this country. Um, the rest of the guide, uh, we also go through, even though I said rules are different in every single state, um, there are still some fundamental 
steps, talk about those fundamental steps in here and potentially potential stories that you could be doing at each stage of the process. I mean, there's stuff going on all the time related to elections, and every single one of those offers an opportunity um, for stories. Um, we also have like six pages of potential sources for you and resources. It's only a drop in the bucket. There are so many other resources. These are some of the main ones that I thought of. And we also have a bunch of story ideas that I threw together, but you know, whatever, they just kind of came out of my head. Um, so I am more than happy to talk more about this. Um, again, I think if you go to the online version, you can also get the, the links. And I have more copies of this too, if anybody needs it. Anyway, please guys, I'm, I'm so glad you're doing this. And um, you know, every, people are really counting. I mean, it's so important. I think I realize almost now that I've left journalism how important it is, what the, the role that you play. So, thanks. Well, there are approximately 9,000 plus election officials in this country, too. And most of us have no idea who you are. <laughs> Don't take that offensively. There are 60,000 of you. Plus, we have foreign press that, that you know, ha has interest in U.S. elections, too. And some of the reasons for that are, number one, election officials are being kind of in a state of fear right now. Fear for a few different things. Fear for their, their own safety, frankly. I'm an election official threatened after the November 2020 election. Election officials are fearful of that. They are. They don't want to amplify their name. There are some of us out there that are willing to do that. The three of us are doing that consistently, almost on a daily basis, understanding that there is still risk attached to that, even in the roles that we play. And so as election officials are looking at that conversation with you, please understand some of that is going beyond just they're, they're not answering your call. They're weighing the risk. And some of that is, is their personal risk. They're also weighing the risk professionally that um, have kind of had a little bit of a muzzle put on them, right? They're, there's, they're not being encouraged by their local uh, teams to speak publicly <clears throat> about anything election related because of the controversy that is surrounding it. So there is a um, kind of a, an atmosphere of let's just take care of business and mind our own business uh, kind of mentality out there. So there's this, again, weighing the risk, not only um, personally, but also professionally uh, of speaking out. So I'm trying to just let you understand why maybe they're not so um, quick to say, oh, USA Today wants to talk to me. I am taking that call right now. You know, they're like, do I know who this person is? Do I trust that they're going to represent what it is that I'm saying in a way that I want for it to be come across to the reader? Or do they have some other type of motive? And if I don't know you, I'm probably going to vet you out before I bother having that interview with you. And, and, and again, it goes back to that, that risk type uh, environment that they're working in. And I think that some of that too is that we've lost local journalism and that breaks my heart. I mean, I'm a person, just so you know, I subscribe to a lot of papers. So if you check my American Express accounts, <laughs> I have lots of monthly payments that come out of American Express that subscribe to all of you because I want to support the work that you do. The news is like happening like that. Your, your staff is a fraction of what you were. Guess what? For election officials, it's the same thing. We're um, underpaid. What that causes is this disconnect, right? Because I knew you for six months, but now you've changed and you've gone to another paper or you've gone to another media outlet and I have no clue that you've left and some person from your organization is now cold calling me to have a conversation, right? Um, so establishing, keeping those relationships ongoing, even if you've left, maybe doing that introduction if possible to this is the person who's going to take my place on this beat. Um, so that there's this kind of soft handoff, if you will, from you to uh, another journalist. Also, the fact that we're under attack. Your profession's under attack. People blast the media all the time. 
guess what? We're under attack too. So think of all the things that you think of when it comes to those three things and how you approach your profession and understand that election officials are also looking through that same lens as they're approaching theirs. Uh, a few things, I know Pam's hit like a, a lot of things here that I think are Im important, but um, also know that a, a lot of election officials have this mentality is if they end up in the paper, it's been a bad day. That's just the way they think. They're like nose to the grind people, do the hard work, and the last thing they want is to see their name in a paper because it's been something bad that has happened. So again, going back to Pam's uh, comment of sharing some good stories, uh, one of the things that um, they shared in the Oakland Press, which is a local paper in Oakland County, uh, which is Rochester Hills is where we're at. Uh, for instance, we had three generations serve as polling, uh, poll workers um, in one election cycle. That was a super good, feel good story. Um, that was people loved hearing, but another thing that that reporter allowed me to do, which I would encourage you to do, is he kind of gave me a carrot. He's like, yeah, this is a really great feel-good story, but what else can I share that maybe you've been wanting to share that you haven't had opportunity about how people, you know, come about being a poll worker, how they serve, what are the benefits of that, what would they gain from that? So offering that opportunity to um, let them get some information out there that maybe they haven't had the power or the voice to do before um, will make them more likely to take that call with you and to um, provide you some comment. Also, um, we talked about, I talked about deadlines and, and the understaffing just in one of the local offices today, um, an office of 12 people, they've had four people in the last three months put in their resignation. Um, it, it is um, tight for them with the being understaffed. Please respect that. Um, understanding election laws, and Pam uh, touched on this a little bit, uh, attend to logic and accuracy tests. I mean, that's kind of even just a funky phrase, right? Logic and accuracy test, and election officials call it LNA, and we have all this terminology that we use. Attend one of those. Chad Livengood did that. Um, with the Detroit News, um, came to my office, sat through the whole logic and accuracy testing that we did. It's That also helps build that trust relationship, but when you go to talk about this and the process or someone challenging the process, you can say, hey, I sat in on that when they actually tested all that machinery and I saw what happened. So you're getting firsthand knowledge and understanding of how the process works. Uh, be a poll worker, really easy, right? Um, serve on a receiving board. Does anybody know what a receiving board is? Great, serve on one. Call your local clerk. <laughs> so after an election night, all of those workers, so I had 400 poll workers in Rochester Hills. The chairs and co-chairs of all 32 of my precincts were required to come back, and this is a requirement in Michigan, to a receiving board. And that team goes through all of their paperwork, checks all their seals on all their bags, make sure that everything balances, all the signatures are where they're supposed to be, all the seals are properly sealed on all the different containers before this then goes to a county canvassing board. You're gonna learn a ton about the process and how that works and the troubleshooting that takes place throughout the day by serving on a receiving board. Connect to groups like the elections group, I'm gonna shamelessly plug us. We are 20 people strong uh, across this country. We're almost all former election officials from all different states. Um, and as she mentioned, every state does things completely different. And when you get pla to places like Michigan, we do things really differently here. And you have over 1,200, actually over 1,300 election officials just in this state. If you look at over the 9,000 election officials in this country, like a third of them are just in Michigan and Wisconsin doing things differently. That fact checking and accuracy is gonna be incredibly important and we need you as allies, as election officials. We need you that when you see something that doesn't look right or sound right, that you have created a, a pool of election experts across the country. Hey, I've, got a, I've made a contact in Georgia. I've made a contact in Michigan. I've made a contract in Florida. 
that if something comes out of there, I can reach out to that person and I've established that relationship ahead of time because stuff is going to hit the fan come November. It's just going to happen, folks. Brace yourself. Something will happen somewhere. I mean, I've been in Michigan. I've been in Georgia. I've seen things happen, right? It's going to happen somewhere. It just always does. Something happens. And making sure that you have created this pool of people who are experts that you can, can reach out to. And that um, fact checking, one of the things that I would point out and how critical it is in the role that you play in that November 2020 election, I mentioned to you that I was threatened. Prior to that threat, in that week of the election, um, a national political figure held a press conference here in Michigan actually in the county where I was on the ballot to be the Oakland County clerk as a Republican candidate, held a press conference in the county Republican office and made an accusation that was inaccurate about the city where I administered elections. Never called me by name, but referenced my city. I had no idea this press conference had even happened. The only way I found out about this was a Lansing reporter called me and said, Tina, do you want to respond? At this point, this is a press conference held by them that's gone national. And a local reporter called me and said, would you like to respond? And I said, I have no idea what you're even talking about. And he sent me a link to the press conference. I had a matter of just a couple of hours to draft a response that I put out on Twitter and I alerted every media source I could find and said, I will be putting this out there in the next 30 minutes, my response to that press conference. And by the help of all of you in amplifying that <clears throat> tweet that I put out, within 72 hours, I had 1.2 million views of my response to that national press conference that was held. What I will also say is that person never said my city again and never said my name again because we immediately responded in the moment to inaccurate information and with the help of all of you and being able to amplify truth, what could have been an additional conspiracy was stopped right in the moment. That is the power that we have when you work together with us to amplify truth in the moment when dis and misinformation tries to take over the election cycle. And as we go into November, it's going to be critical that those relationships are even stronger than they've ever been. Also just, um, Pam mentioned too that, like I said, stuff's gonna happen. Uh, and making sure that you know who the crisis communicators are. Uh, just a heads up, most election officials, especially as you get um, to the decentralized area, they do not have a public information officer. That clerk that you're talking to is probably HR. She's probably the clerk over elections. She's probably the clerk over accounting. She probably runs a few cemeteries, probably you know does FOIA. That was me in, in Rochester Hills, right? I was like clerk of council. I had birth and death records. I had all of that stuff. I had three cemeteries. Plus, you know, elections were like a sliver of what I did. And even in a community of 75,000, which is a wealthier community in Oakland County, I did not have a public information officer. Most clerks do not, most election officials do not. So also like being mindful of that when you're approaching them, that you're going to be talking with them directly. And if they're in a crisis, um, that may not be what their first call is, but it also might be their first call because they're going to need you. And then just lastly, um, the post-election responsibilities, please repeat after me, unofficial, official, unofficial, official, okay? Two different things, and they can have huge impact on what happens. That time between the unofficial results and the canvas, that time when you work out all the crazy little wonky problems that happen when you hire 400 people to do a job for one day that have had two hours of training and you expect them to do something perfectly, those crazy wonky things that happen on that day, that's what the canvas period is for, is to correct that. Making sure that as you're reporting this, I know everybody wants to be the first to call a race, everybody wants to be the first one to do that, um, but please make sure 
you being incredibly clear with the public. This is unofficial and will not be official until whatever the canvas date is of that certification for that particular state. And then after election, don't forget your election officials. That's that time period to continue to build those relationships, to understand each other. What did you miss? What did they miss? How could you have worked together better? Collaboration and communication are going to be key to the success of the media and the, su the success of election officials in this election cycle. So I'll be here for any questions, but thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Hi, everyone. Um, I, I was just thinking that uh, about 15 to 20 years ago, this briefing would have been just me and Pam Fessler on a phone call. Um, so, uh, so one of the things that we've experienced in the last particularly eight years or so is that um, there's been a, a bringing together of journalists and experts and election officials, which is one of the best things to come out of what is otherwise kind of a, a pretty challenging time. Um, We've been talking about what keeps us up at night. First, I want to talk a little bit about what's not keeping me up at night. Um, what's not keeping me up at night is how well the election will actually be run this fall. Um, we run elections better than ever before in American history. That is not my opinion. That is objective fact. They are more secure. They are more transparent. They are more verifiable than at any time in the entirety of American history. There are things like our voter lists, which are more accurate now thanks to technology, but thanks to better data practices, thanks to data sharing with things like the Electronic Registration Information Center or ERIC, thanks to all kinds of innovations that have made voter registration lists more accurate today than they've ever been. It's always challenging to keep voter lists up to date because as we're sitting here, people are moving, people are doing what I call aging out of voting. Um, they die. Uh, they, they are aging into voting, uh, which is much more positive. Um, but we're doing a better job of that today than ever before. We have more paper ballots than ever before in American history since technology has been introduced into, into uh, voting. 95% of all American voters are plus are going to vote on paper ballots this fall, including every single voter in all of the battleground states. The only states with some, paper, some digital ballots that don't have a paper component are not battleground states, states like Louisiana, entirely, Mississippi, a lot of it, Tennessee, states like that. We have paper ballots in all of those states. So when someone complains about the technology, you will know that they have actual paper ballots in those states that they can go back to and check, and they do, because we also have more audits. In all of those states with paper ballots, we have audits of those paper ballots. And that means that someone is going back and double checking the machine counts with hand counts to confirm the machines accurately counted those ballots. We have more pre-election litigation than ever before. And that's not always a bad thing. In fact, it's often good because it clarifies the rules of the election. Not everyone is going to like the rules. I guarantee you, some of the part, both parties are going to hate some of the rules. But those rules are set on election day, and everyone knows what those rules are. And then we have more post-election litigation that confirms and verifies the results than ever before. When you hear disinformation, Pam was talking about engaging with some of the conspiracy theorists. One of the first questions I'd love to see the conspiracy theorists asked is why are you putting this out on social media? Why isn't this being presented to a court of law? Because still to this day, over 44 months since the 2020 election, there has not been one single shred of evidence presented to any court anywhere in this country that cast doubt on the outcome of that election. And that's because all of the claims made on social media would crumble when they get to a court and are subjected to scrutiny and cross-examination. Um, and yet, despite all of these good things about elections, what's keeping me up at night is that all of that might not matter. That we are objectively, in reality, doing a great job of running elections, thanks to people like Tina Barton, thanks to her colleagues all over the country. Um, and those election officials have been subjected to nonstop abuse, threats, and harassment for the last four years not because they did a bad job, but because they somehow managed the highest turnout in American history in the middle of a global pandemic, and that election has withstood scrutiny for almost four years now. Um, as, as Kevin mentioned, uh, my organization runs the Election Official Legal Defense Network. We founded it in, uh, in 2021. The co-chairs are Bob Bauer, former Obama White House counsel, Ben Ginsburg, former counsel to Mitt Romney, and George W. Bush. Um, 
And I'm very proud that we do this work and we provide assistance to election officials all over the country. And I also hope very soon we'll be able to sunset this work because it won't be necessary anymore. It makes me actually, gets me kind of emotional, a little bit angry that a nonprofit like mine has to provide legal assistance and advice to public servants all over this country who are doing their jobs and are subjected to harassment. Um, we should understand that the disinformation environment about our elections and the reason I'm worried about it not being, um, uh, not mattering that we're running elections so well, has nothing to do with legitimate policy disagreements that exist. There are legitimate policy disagreements in elections that we're still refining. How much mail voting is the right amount in a particular state? How can we better keep voter lists up to date? How can we make access as easy as possible but make sure that we've maintained integrity? These are all legitimate policy disagreements that are going on. But what's really coming down in the disinformation environment is not those. What it really comes down to is it's solely based on outcome. Election rules are good in places where my candidate won. Election rules are bad in the places where my candidate lost. And it's important to keep that in mind when assessing any claims. Um, and the people who push disinformation often take advantage of what Tina and Pam mentioned, which is that elections are very esoteric. That's why you're here in this room. You're wanting to learn about this stuff. 99.999% of Americans don't really understand much about how elections are run. If you ask them, they think, you know, the election officials around this country show up on the Monday before the election, set up the machines, and that's all that's going on. They're working overtime all the time. And they leverage that esoteric nature, the weeds of election administration, to breed distrust in how we run elections to aim at those states and those election officials and those processes where their candidate happens to lose. And I think it's really important to keep that in mind when assessing and reporting on these, on these claims. Um, there are basically two groups of disinformation spreaders. One is nefarious, one is not. The, nefar the nefarious group are the people at the top of the pyramid. The people who are actually uh, trying to achieve political power. They are making money off of disinformation. They are making boatloads of money. Sidney Powell raised tens of millions of dollars in the aftermath of the 2020 election. Donald Trump raised, raised hundreds of millions of dollars in the aftermath of the lies, uh, spreading lies about the 2020 election. Um, and many of them know they're spreading lies. And those are bad actors. But the vast majority of people who are spreading information are good Americans who are disappointed in the outcomes of elections. And I think it's important to understand that too. It is normal to be disappointed in the outcomes of elections. I hope you all have been disappointed in the outcomes of elections. I don't know many people who've, been, who've loved the outcome of every single election they voted for. Um, that's normal. What's not normal is to refuse to accept that and to try to leverage that distrust and aim it at public servants. Um, and so understand that many of the people who are spreading disinformation are really deluded by a, a constant diet of lies that they are being fed and the media bubbles in which they live that encourage those lies. And I think, um, I think that's important to remember. Um, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail about this, but I want to go into kind of how, um, how some of these, uh, the disinformation about specific things are being spread and use some examples. One is... Portraying, I mentioned portraying these things as legitimate disagreements on policy. So for instance, you've probably been following all of the news about um, alleged non-citizens voting. In the House, a bill was introduced. Um, I, if you follow me on Twitter, um, I've been talking about this quite a bit. Um, this is a made-up claim. It is completely made up. And the evidence of the fact that it's made up is if People thought this was a real issue. Why are they bringing it up in July of a presidential election year? No one who has a serious policy prescription brings it up four months before a presidential election. That is a generally good applicable rule. So you know what's going on there. That's about politics, not policy at that point. Um, I won't go into all the non-citizen voting stuff because you can follow that later. Um, but I'd be happy to talk with any of you about that kind of stuff. The attacks on ERIC, the Electronic Registration Information Center, are another good example of that. Completely made up in an effort to reduce the guardrails around our elections because a lot of the people spreading disinformation want there to be more chaos in the post-election period. That enables them, it creates a vacuum they can fill with lies and raise money. So when you see things like, we should all be voting on election day and not have early and mail voting anymore, that creates 
chaos post-election and even during election. If you see things like, we should be hand counting all ballots, good luck with that. We have the most complex ballots in the world. We can't hand count ballots in the period of time that it takes to um, certify electors on December 11th. Um, that's because they want more chaos to fill that period. When you see things like attacks on Eric, that's because they want more problems at the polls with less accurate voter lists. Um, and you see a, very, a variety of the actors in the bad actor category. Um, frivolous litigation. Here in Michigan, a nonprofit brought a lawsuit against the voter lists and the voter registration list maintenance practices. It was dismissed in federal court, and within less than two weeks, the RNC filed an almost identical lawsuit. I'm a lawyer. I used to litigate with the Department of Justice. That is not a good faith way to litigate. As I said, I don't think all pre-election litigation, in fact, even most pre-election litigation is frivolous. It's not. It's good in most cases. That is a good example of one that's, one that's not particularly good. And you also see nonprofits kind of feeding the same narrative. Heritage just listed a report where they said incumbency is the greatest threat to elections, and they, and they, no they, they noted President Biden was the incumbent and said he won't leave office. And this whole report was said without a trace of irony about what had happened with the previous incumbent who had been in office. They literally did not mention the previous incumbent at that time. So take that into account. When we're talking about disinformation, I really look at it as two clear phases. They can be broken down a little more than that, but I think there are two clear phases with different intents. The phase we're in right now, up until the point in time when the polls close in each, juris each jurisdiction, that disinformation is aimed at voters. It is, it is aimed at changing voter behavior, either intentionally or unintentionally, making them, feel as it, making them uh, believe lies about candidates, making them believe lies about the process, confusing voters, making them think their vote doesn't matter. It's going to be targeted at that. The easiest way to suppress a voter is to get them to self-suppress. Voter suppression in actuality doesn't exist in many places in the United States, but self-suppression does through disinformation. As soon as the polls close, in that instant, we will be in the second phase. And that second phase will be designed to get supporters of the candidate who is perceived to be losing to believe that the election was stolen, to incite them to anger, hatred of their fellow Americans, and potentially violence. And the period of time I'm most concerned about is that period of time. From November 5th when the polls close, to December 11th when the electors are ascertained, to December 17th when the electors meet, to January 6th when Congress meets, to January 20th. I don't think anyone that you talk to who's an expert or an election official is going to take a deep breath until 12.01 p.m. on January 20th, 2025. And there's a, there's a very good reason for that. So I, 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 wanna, I wanna push, I wanna suggest a way to kind of address some of, some of the myths about elections that are believed sometimes by both parties in many cases and often pervade a lot of the narrative. Um, this is one that's often pushed by folks who are perhaps more associated with the left, and that is that voting is hard. I mentioned voter suppression, that voter suppression is widespread, that people are gonna be kept from voting. And I will tell you right now, it has never been easier to vote in the United States of America than it is as we sit here today. And it's not close. We're going to be putting out a lot of, I'm going to talk about resources in a second. We're going to be putting out one, uh, one pagers on a lot of this. There is more access to online voter registration, automatic voter registration, same day registration than ever before. There's more access to mail voting than ever before. 39 states have it without an excuse. There's more access to early voting than ever before. 47 states, 97% of all voters will have access to early voting than ever before. It is easier to vote in this country than ever before. And I don't understand why we're telling people that voting is hard, because it's not. Second, we've already kind of touched on this, that voting is rife with fraud. We have more protections about fraud than ever before. Voter fraud, voting fraud happens, but it's not, so it's not zero, but it's pretty darn close to zero. And this isn't some kind of belief I have. There's this myth that voter fraud is really hard to catch, so what we see is just the tip of the iceberg. Voter fraud is one of the easiest crimes to catch in the United States of America, and I say this as a former DOJ attorney. You have someone who has created a document trail. You have, you have created, a, you've had someone who's walked up and presented themselves in front of multiple witnesses who can testify. You can't hide your identity if you're trying to vote and impersonate another person. 
You've got, if you tried to vote someone else's ballot in any kind of scale, like submitting a mail ballot for someone else, what's going to happen is that person's going to try to vote. And the election officials will notice that someone tried to vote and you had a mail ballot. And if that happened on any kind of scale, it would be identified. That's how we've caught instances where, on a local level, mail ballot fraud was attempted in places like North Carolina and Connecticut, because that's exactly what happened. And we checked every signature. Right. I was just going to get to that. Um, so I want to talk a little bit also about this um, idea, and it is true, that election rules and procedures are different everywhere, and we have a very decentralized system. That is true. However, this idea is leveraged by those who lose elections and want to incite doubt to make you believe that, for instance, election rules in Ohio are great, but in Georgia, they're, not, they're, they're awful. They have almost identical election rules in those two states. And then I would suggest, and I'm gonna, we're going to put out a one-pager on this as well, that at, the, at a big picture level, and Tina kind of alluded to this, um, every state has the same basic fundamental protections about elections in, in place. In every single state, you have to get on a list in order to vote. Has anyone ever heard the, um, that North Dakota doesn't have voter registration? Has anyone heard that? It's true. North Dakota doesn't have voter registration. They do have a list. They just don't call it voter registration. And you have to get on that list. And if you're not on the list in advance, you have to bring ID and get on the list when you vote. Pretty much the same way you do it here in Michigan or Wisconsin or other states that have same-day registration. In every state, you have to get on a list. In order to get on that list, in every state, you have to provide ID. Every state conducts list maintenance to keep those lists up to date. Every state verifies your ident identity when you get a ballot, one way or the other. Some do it by ID, others do it on other methods. They, when I go to vote, they ask me to say what my address is and ask me for information that only I would have. Every state does that. And every state verifies mail ballots when they come in, as Tina mentioned. Every state does these things. Every state checks their machines to make sure they were counted. And yet, we're going to see that leveraged, and what you're going to see is the one difference is the outcome, not really at the big picture levels of, of, of election procedures. Um, and lastly, and I'm, I'm glad Tina mentioned this, does, that, does everyone remember when we used to know who won the election on election night? Everyone remember that? Can I see hands? No, you don't. Put your hands down. Um, we have never known who won the election on election night, ever. We just think we do because we have a partial count, we have exit polls, we have other data, and the media calls it. I guarantee you at 8.01 p.m. Pacific time, California will be called for the Democratic candidate for president. Do you know what percentage of ballots they will have counted in California at that point in time? Closer to 0% than 1%. But we will know because the margins are big and because we have exit polls. Here in Michigan, they could do the best job ever, and we're probably not going to know for a day or two. And that's okay. Um, the biggest variable in determining whether, when, we, when we think we know who won an election is margin of victory. That is the single biggest variable, and it is the one variable that election officials have absolutely no control over whatsoever. Um, so briefly, I want to I go into... Um, some resources, since that was supposedly the topic that I avoided up until now. Um, so first of all, um, many of you already attend these, but I hold regular media briefings um, to talk about issues that might be coming up. So starting in September, I'm going to be doing these weekly. Um, email me if you want to get on our list, dbecker at electioninnovation.org. Um, love to have lots of people on them. I hope those who've been in them have found them to be useful, uh, useful resources. Um, Follow me on Twitter. I'll put a plug in for that. I tend to, I just did a big thing on um, uh, Elon Musk, um, uh, who is the number one super spreader of election disinformation in the world right now. Uh, in the last 24 hours, he's put out claims that uh, Biden is importing voters. Uh, these claims have been seen by literally tens, if not hundreds of millions of people. And I hope my tweets get seen by uh, hundreds. Um, uh, as I met, Oh, that's great. I'm going to pat myself on the back for that. That's awesome. Um, uh, we're going to put out a series of one-pagers. I, I think it's, um, I hope you find them useful. They're also directed at voters themselves. 
to kind of put some of these things in a high level context. Those that spread disinformation want to get everyone into the weeds as far down as possible. They want to point out the differences between Maricopa County, Arizona and Clark County, Nevada and how they review each signature and whether one uses software and one uses people and one uses you know, three people and the other uses five people. And that, they, they want to get into that because that's how they breed doubt amongst the people who are sincerely disappointed in the outcome where they, they're looking for reasons to doubt the outcome. So important to stay high level a lot of the time. We're going to put them out on election security, we're going to put them out on voter registration, and we're going to put one out on the kind of the common factors amongst all the states. And then lastly, um, some of you might have seen it. I, uh, guessing by the sales, I would guess you haven't. Uh, the, uh, I wrote a book with Major Garrett of CBS News. I do, I do CBS News. Uh, uh, I'm a contributor for CBS News on election law issues um, called The Big Truth, which goes into a lot of the details about the 2020 election. And um, I, I've been told by uh, the people who bought and read it, all of whom have the last name Becker, um, <laughs> that uh, it was useful to them. So hopefully you'll, be, you'll find those as re, uh, useful as resources. Obviously, get in touch with me or, or Tina or Pam anytime on any of these issues. There are a lot of anxious questions. <laughs> uh, Hi, uh, Caroline Cummings, WCCO TV, uh, CBS News, Minnesota. I know we're partner. Uh, CBS is our partner. Um, they own us. Uh, Paramount does. Anyway, <laughs> um, so I'm familiar with your work, David. Um, question for you um, on this election misinformation spreading on social media you touched on. Um, how do you see the best way for reporters to combat it knowing that the sources that we may be citing are the very types of sources. I'm talking, um, you know, government officials. You're a former DOJ attorney who knows this well, but there's a, a kind of um, distrust there with those institutions. So it's like you're telling somebody that the sky is blue, but the sky is green, and there's no way, even if you show them the sky is blue, that they will understand that. Um, so I know that that's kind of a you know really large question, and what we're all really trying to tackle here. But knowing there's you know that distrust, what's the best way to, in your view, approach people in this way so they, you know, don't write you off just because you're using these things that they think are full of, you know, misinformation when they're not. Yeah, it's even, it's even worse than that. It is, um, look, if, if someone said the sky was blue and the other said the sky was green, you'd probably go out and look at the sky. Um, this is a little different. This is one side saying one plus one equals two, and the other side one says one plus one equals polka dots. I mean, you, you, there's, so it's very difficult to address this in many ways. And I think one of the things you have to understand, I think debunking has, um, is useful, but it's limited because the disinformation is already out there and often requires you to repeat the disinformation in the first place to debunk it. So I think getting out in front of these things, Pam alluded to this, or, or is often it, really important. Tell the story of our successful, secure elections process before they come at you. I also think um, the, the messenger is really important. Um, I have found that if it happens that Republicans are, are, are the ones who are claiming that elections are stolen, um, that's not always the case, by the way, but it's mostly the case currently. Um, find messengers who are Republicans. I mean, Tina talked about how effective a messenger she was, and she was. I mean, she, her, her role was incredibly important in the days and weeks after the 2020 election. And um, she's too humble to say this. She, um, she, took a, she was a target and continues to be in many ways. I mean, she's a hero. Um, and so find people who are willing to do that. Today in Arizona, there's an election. Stephen Richard, the Republican recorder for Maricopa County, is on the ballot against two election deniers. I don't know if he's going to win or not on the primary election, but he is an important, heroic person. And, and finding those people who will speak the truth um, it is, in some states, it's easier than others. Um, and so I think, that's, I think that's one of the key ways to get at it. And I just think, I, I'll stress again, they, they have a playing field. When I say they, I mean those who are pushing disinformation. They have a playing field they want you, the media, to play on. Think about the non-citizen voting claims. They want to say non-citizen voting is a risk. 
The other side says non-citizen voting isn't a risk, and here's how the two parties are, are battling it out. That's actually not what's happening. I mean, if someone wants to claim there's a problem, I, again, I'm a lawyer, not a journalist, but I would say, where's your proof? And some journalists ask that of Speaker John, uh, um, Johnson? Johnson. Yeah, why did I just go blank on him for a second? Um, uh, because it changes. And, 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 and he said, well, I don't, but I just, I feel, I feel like it is. I sa he said something to that effect. I mean, that's an incredible admission. I mean, you're bringing legislation to the House floor based on a feeling? <laughs> Um, you're claiming that the election was stolen in Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania in 2020, and you had an absolute right to recounts in all three of those states statewide, and you chose not to do a recount in any of those states, a statewide recount in any of those states? Right. I mean, change this and push it back. I, I, again, I think like a lawyer, I think in terms of cross-examination often, but I would like to push this back and shift the burden onto those spreading lies because they, um, they have not paid the price fully yet, although that's starting. I'm sorry. You know, I talked about not dismissing the people who are challenging elections. I mean, if you follow them on social media or some of the groups there, I, I, I pointed out in this guide, the Election Integrity Group uh, Network, which is run by Cleta Mitchell. I mean, if you follow, they do a lot of stuff on social media and rumble. If you, if you, you would have seen this, not this non-citizen thing emerging a year ago. Because they were starting to formulate this whole concept that this was, you know, a way to blame Biden because of what was going on in the border. That's all part of one big picture. Anyway, I, I really want to push that, that you, you, you need to monitor what's going on with these groups because then you'll see the stuff and then you can get ahead of the story. Can I also just quickly say, too, don't lose sight of the fact of that trust in government is at its highest point, at its lowest point, the most local point. And that is where people have a lot of trust still in the institution is more at the local level. The higher you go up, the, you know, the more they're losing trust in that. Um, making sure that you are, as I said, developing those relationships with some local election officials that you can reach out to in that crisis comms moment or when you're trying to respond to some sort of a, a conspiracy about their state or their, their county or community. <laughs> Brian Schott with the Salt Lake Tri Tri Tribune. David, I actually read your book, and you um, paint a scenario uh, of an election day incident, uh, I believe it was in Texas, where you have an amateur poll watcher who's carrying a gun because it's an open, uh, an open uh, car carry state, uh, who believes that someone who may not be eligible to vote is voting, and violence happens. How do we talk to local um, election officials about this very pl plausible thing when you know it's it's a nightmare scenario? So I'm curious yeah, how, so, how uh, we talk about that. Um, first of all, the check is in the mail. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> sec secondly, you've raised actually my least favorite part of the book, um, uh, and I, I won't. I, uh, I, I think this is really difficult. Both Major and I had real concerns in the aftermath of the election that we were a hair's breadth away from, um, uh, we didn't call it civil war, but kind of a disentanglement of the states. That we, we, we so viewed our fellow Americans as enemies, and we had so delegitimized that process by which we choose our leaders, which means the process by which we choose the losers, the people who don't get to lead. That is what's, that's what elections are. And we had so delegitimized that that violence was the next, and it was in the aftermath of January 6th, this wasn't hypothetical. I actually would advise not to engage in what a good friend of mine, Justin Levitt, who is a um, law professor at Loyola, um, calls electoral process porn, um, which is ima imagining all of the worst possible scenarios and playing them out for people um, to try to figure out uh, you know, the, the, you, you know that's what I do, right? I, 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 it's, it's, I, I, I'm going to I'm going to urge you to resist. Um, it's the and I get questions about this. You know, the questions like uh, before Biden withdrew, what happens if he uh, what, what happens if he has a heart attack on Halloween? I, I'm not going to go there, right? This doesn't mean I don't think about these things. I do, and everyone here does, and we all think about this to some degree. But most we have to understand in a presidential election in November of this year. 30 to 40 percent of the people who vote will have at the most voted once in the previous four years, and many of them not at all. They don't do this a lot. And this means that they have what I call the fragile psyche of the American electorate, that things about violence um, prospectively are, um, can have a negative impact on voters 
thoughts about participation. So I think we should think about this. I think off the record, we can, we can talk about this to some degree, but I think it is not constructive to, to put out the nightmare scenarios in advance of an election when voters already are on the default to not vote. They're, all, they're always leaning that way for a variety of reasons. And all you need to do is give them one little reason, like it could be dangerous, or it could be hard, or it might not matter, or there might be somewhat a fraudulent vote canceling out their vote, that they'll go to the other side and just say, what's the point? Can I look at that from a different perspective? Um, so I'm the vice chair for the Committee for Safe and Secure Elections. And one of the things that we do is um, we're a committee of about 30 people, half cor uh, current or former law enforcement, half current and former election officials. And I travel the country with fellow election officials, law enforcement. We facilitate conversations between election officials, law enforcement, um, all the way from the local up to the federal level, as well as you know, PIOs, emergency managers. And we do work through some of those scenarios. We have a scenario specifically that talks about should a voter come in and um, accuse another voter of not being a citizen and, and a disruption occurs. Let's walk through what that would look like, how we would respond, how the election official would respond, law enforcement, what they can and cannot do in that, that scenario. How do we prevent it from happening or at least um, make it less of an impact? So there is, while I agree with all of those things of not putting a, a fear out there, there's also um, a, a point of being ready should things happen. And I think that's something that law enforcement has always done in ways like school, you know, school, they go in and do trainings in case, in case there's a school shooting. I live in Oxford Township, so that's something that's very real to me, right? Um, but I think that's something now they're starting to look at election day as becoming an event that there needs to be conversation ahead of time of what we would do to make sure that um, you know, election officials are safe, the election process is safe, and that no voter is either threatened, intimidated, or harassed um, on their way to vote, and that they can do so freely and fairly. So we are having those conversations around that, um, but we're having them around a table where we're collaborating and communicating with other, each other more in um, a prepared type of, of scenario. I cover cybersecurity at Axios. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about the disinformation landscape, and in particular, the impact that a lot of GOP threats have had against CISA, against the disinformation research community, the, the ways in which those resources are changing for state and local officials heading into uh, what seems like it's going to be a wave of disinformation targeting this election as voting processes are changing and it's just ripe for misinformation when you have like a new candidate and an incumbent who drops out and there's all these things, right? And I, I'm curious how, I guess, resources for state and local officials have changed to fact check and call social media companies. Things like that have changed in terms of disinformation between 2020 and 2024 and any concerns you might have about the impact of like a lot of GOP, especially GOP House lawmakers have had targeting CISA, dissuading them from being super engaged in this. Yeah, anything along those lines. I mean, I take it. You, you, you <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I would say that, you know, you're, you're right. I mean, obviously, all a lot of the efforts that came into uh, being after to, uh, 2020 no longer exist. Right, because the, the the government and election officials started working really closely about sharing information, trying to work with the social media companies to find, and, and a lot of that has gone away. Um, again, I would just say that that's why it's so important to get ahead of the story and to explain the process ahead of time. What is going on? Um, I think there was um, just a story that was the Fox affiliate in Phoenix did, I thought, a really great story on what happens to my mail ballot from beginning to end. When you mail your ballot, all of the steps along the way. They did it ahead of the primary. Um, and it's that kind of stuff that, that, that I see that really as on, the only way you're going to fight the disinformation. Because these, you know, the, the, we, we have seen that there is a huge segment of the public, they don't, 
excuse my language, don't give a shit what the truth is. I mean, they're going to believe what they want to believe. And every single effort for you to counter that disinformation, you're just going to go down a little hole. So you have to kind of appeal to those groups of people who are willing and open to um, the truth. There was a really important statement put out um, uh, about 10 days after the election in November 2020 by um, a group of uh, government organizations and collaborative groups with of election officials, um, uh, CISA in particular, um, that said the election was secure and verifiable and transparent. I am personally very concerned that we will not see a statement like that again from the federal government because of the chilling of, of government speech. And I can tell you firsthand, working with election officials during that time, I was talking to election officials on the phone every single day, and um, that that statement was really important to supporting their efforts as they were on doing their ongoing work. Um, and Until so, they actually got fired. Yeah. I mean, you literally got fired within hours. Um, yeah, uh, Chris Krebs we're talking about. But um, but yeah, I, th I, th I do have concerns about that. So we're, we're going to do. Hi. <laughs> Taylor Golden, same with the Houston Chronicle. Thank you for doing this. Um, Ms. Fessler, you were talking about, you know, talk to the conspiracy theorists and, you know, sometimes they may have valid complaints. I think that especially, um, you know, when we're in Texas and there are Republicans with election integrity committees within the Republican Party, it might do a lot in the way of trust to write stories about some of their concern areas, even if you're still obviously putting it in context that this is maybe not as large of an issue as they think it is, but there are some valid points to it. What what are some of those areas where you do think there actually is some room to improve election processes that we can maybe write about to give them more confidence? Um, actually, I don't think I said that they have valid complaints, okay. but I mean, but but there but but there are some because I think as David alluded to, you have two different groups of people who are spreading disinformation. You're the ones who know better, and the ones who really believe and have confusion about the system and think there are problems, and they think they're quite frankly doing the Lord's work. You know, they're trying to save the country. Um, I I do think like the whole area of voter lists. Um, and, you know, that, that, you know that, that, that there is a lot of confusion, like how do you clean up? How do you have the most accurate voter list? Because that does leave open the question of, um, in, in the public's mind, that um, there are um, that, that that this just doesn't seem right, right? That there's all these names of dead and um, people who have moved. Um, I, I do think that's a legitimate area, public policy area. What can we do better to clean up voter list, right? So there's that. There's um, you know. Um, you know, just what, what facilities, are there enough polling places for all the people who need to poll? I mean, there are certain concerns, and unfortunately, that's the bad thing about what's happened with our politics. We've gotten so divided that you can't even talk about the real things in voting that do need to be addressed. Um, so I think what you can do is, you know, pick out one, you know, some of those things, but then talk about what is actually in place already. You just have to put it in context. And the only way you're going to be able to put it in the context is if you understand um, how the system works and what election officials are already doing to address those things. Does that make sense? I'm, I, 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 well, let me just say, you know, I mean, I was saying that you should follow a lot of these groups because I think it's an important part of the story to know what they are thinking and what they are planning to do and why and where they're getting their information, what is motivating, what is behind um, their feelings. Stephen Gruber Miller with the Des Moines Register. So we have a Republican Secretary of State, former defender of Eric, who... Um, you know, after several other states left Eric, Iowa also left Eric. And it it became, you know, it got to the point where, you know, of course there were bad faith claims about Eric in the beginning, but then it gets to the point where people have, um, you know, a bad perception of the organization, right? More people are exposed to these things and they may not know, the, you know, the truth or the the good or the bad of it and then states are leaving so then there becomes both like a political and a practical reason for Iowa to leave because if a bunch of states have left there's not as much utility in cross checking et cetera et cetera so you know it, it kind of becomes this cycle of well there was a 
a rumor, you know, a misinformation spread about it. People then believe it, and so then they have concerns about its accuracy, and then there becomes the practical pylon. So I'm kind of curious. That's just one example, but you could apply it to passing different types of voting laws, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of curious if you could address that sort of cycle. Yeah. Um, so I might be a, 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 a wide-eyed optimist, but I am really attracted to political courage. And mm -hmm. um, uh, you don't need to ask what Brad Raffensperger in Georgia is going to do if one side is telling lies and the other side is telling the truth. You don't need to ask Lieutenant Governor Henderson in Utah what she's going to do if one side is telling lies and the other is telling the truth. You don't need to ask Secretary of State Mike Adams in Kentucky. You don't need to ask Tina Barton. You don't need to ask T Stephen Richer. You don't need to ask uh, Justin Roebuck here in Michigan. You don't need to ask some of these people if they are going to kowtow to a lie to achieve some kind of political um, uh, uh, benefit later on. I mean, literally hours before they withdrew from Eric, uh, the Secretary of State of Iowa said that Eric was great. Um, uh, and what you're going to see in some of these states, and you'll, you'll get a chance, at, on, maybe take half a day off on January 20th in the afternoon. I will be drinking. If any of you want to email, I'll, I'll send you a picture. Um, uh, but starting on January 21st, um, what a lot of us who work in the space are going to be doing is we're going to be starting to collect data. And we're going to get data on things like, did the number of provisional ballots go up in Iowa and in Missouri and in West Virginia and in Florida after they left Eric because people had bad information on their voter lists? Mm -hmm. Were the number of same-day registrations in places that got out of Eric, did those go up because people's voter lists weren't as up-to-date? Were, um, were the promises of the state-by-state share, state state sharing agreements which I'm sure some of you have seen. Did they actually end up sharing any data? Because to my knowledge, I know of only two states that have shared data once. And if they did, what did they do with that data? And how did they protect it? Those are gonna be the kinds of things we'll be looking at afterwards. Because I think it is important when those without political courage act on lies, mm -hmm. because it's easy, yeah. to hold them accountable through data and facts. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna have an opportunity to do that, again, after we've had a couple cocktails on the afternoon of January 20th. We'll join you. Uh, <laughs> uh, as you can tell, there are so many more hands that uh, would want to jump into the into this discussion, uh, only because it's uh, been so interesting and 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 because of you. And so we thank you so much for uh, for bringing your your expertise to this discussion. Um, and it's one, as you said, will continue long, long past this date and, and through the 21st. So uh, give it up for, for this panel.